Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bill Baker. I'm located with, uh, with Firestorm in the Atlanta area, and we're pleased that you're able to join us. Uh, this is part of the Crisis Coach webinar series that is sponsored by the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools, and we're delighted to be discussing today predictive intelligence, how to create a robust intelligence network. We'd also invite you to become our friend on Facebook, Firestorm Solutions there. Follow us on Twitter at Firestorm Soul. Use the hashtag Crisis Coach. Firestorm transforms crisis into value and empowers you to manage risk and crises. Firestorm expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. We do want to remind you that today's presentation is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. This information should be discussed in conjunction with advice from your organization's personal counsel. In addition, do not interpret this as legal advice or legal opinion. Our moderator today, and I see that he has just come on. Um, let's uh, open up uh, Rich. if. We can get to you here. Rich, yeah. would you Hi. like to say some nice things about the, uh, the the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools? We're, we're glad to host, host another uh, <clears throat> restaurant uh, with you. And uh, I don't know who the presenter is today. Is yes, Rich, go ahead. We've lost Rich's yeah. volume. We've lost his volume. Okay, but uh, he, we in, have enjoyed having an ongoing relationship with the Tennessee Association, which has uh, been very useful for both of us. You can go to firestorm.com. You can watch past webinars there, and you can register for future webinars in this series. Um, okay, our presenter today, uh, Rich started to say is Karen Mazzullo. Karen is the Chief Intelligence Officer and the Executive Vice President of Firestorm, and we're delighted to have her. She's very experienced in social media, setting up social media monitoring systems, training, uh, all kinds of things of that nature. Karen, over to you, please. Hi, I'm here with Roxanne the Wonder Dog, and she is going to be barking at nothing um, so if you can hear her in the background, I do apologize, um, but um, yeah, she's just not the smartest dog in the world. Um, but she is loyal, and so thank you, you for being a loyal listener in our Tennessee Association of Independent School Sessions. And uh, Rich, thank you for being on. I'm sorry we had a little audio problem there, but we appreciate your support. Please remember that as a member of the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools, all benefits through the value-add relationship and partnership of Firestorm uh, with the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools. If you would like to learn more about any of the uh, no-fee services that we offer uh, as a benefit of your membership, such as an initial uh, no-fee assessment, uh, co-facilitated assessment, $2,500 value. We'll be happy to implement that for you and schedule it for you. Also, our behavioral risk threat assessment program license that, is, that comes with some tremendous training. We're also developing um, some very robust computer-based learning around it that you'll have access to, plus a user group. That's a $7,500 license, no fee to you uh, for the first year, no obligation for the second. And again, that's because you are a member of the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools and we value your participation. So. What we really want to talk about today is, a well, a couple things. We want to talk about predictive intelligence and what is meant by an intelligence network. 
Now, predictive intelligence generally is a term used by marketers. And really, I think it's a term that defines the isolation of separate groups of people by preference. And that preference is not only uh, not always self-selected. Sometimes it's selected for us. I don't know that that's a good thing. So if I like Led Zeppelin as music, it defines me in a specific age. And it says I might like this book. And people who like this book like these TV shows. And people who like these TV shows like these movies. And people who like these movies use this type of shampoo and this type of antiperspirant. And, and that's what happens. It sort of only feeds information to you based upon this demographic criteria. Well, we like to look at it in the opposite way. We like to use it, predictive intelligence, to keep people safer. We like to look at behaviors, but not buying behaviors. We like to look at behaviors of concern and then help you, help someone who is asking for guidance or help to get it when they need it before an event occurs. And we do this in two ways. It is the marriage of two types of things. The first is we must connect with people face to face. So we must understand our environment, what's around us, our social graph as it relates to the three-dimensional world. But then we also must look, must look at our social graph as it relates to the digital world. So it is the combination of our personal face-to-face -face communications with our digital social account communications. So the first thing we need to really ask ourselves is, what's keeping us up at night? What are the things that worry us? that we need to think about so that once we have established a robust intelligence network, we can better respond to these types of evolving threats. And hopefully, we can predict and then plan and perform more appropriately. So the, the, the number one concern, something we're all thinking about all the time, is some sort of loss of life on our campus, on our property, in our buildings. Well, it's certainly a natural disaster. Every state in the, the country, every, every place in the world is prone to its own little unique bit of uh, natural disaster, whether it's flooding, earthquake, tornado, hurricane. I live in South Carolina personally, and we had a thousand year rain event where we had a storm system sit on top of us. We had a, a system out in the ocean. We had rain that fell and fell, and then as the water moved out uh, to try to get back to the ocean, we had significant riverbank flooding. And as a result of that, we had uh, roads wash out. We had ro a loss of life. We had schools that have still not reopened. So it's important to understand what your risks are in your specific area and make sure that you're monitoring and planning for them. And I talk a little bit more about weather or natural disasters because we're used to monitoring for that, right? We, I'd say almost everybody on this call today probably looks at the weather report every single day. That's a form of monitoring that says, hmm, are there any risks out there today? Well, we do the same thing with intelligence monitoring. We look at publicly posted information and aggregate it to say, hmm, I wonder if there are any risks out there today. We also want to look at anything else that may happen with regard to uh, what if there's a major interruption in goods and services that come into your school, uh, food, water. Uh, what if there were, as you may recall, a couple of years ago in West Virginia, there was a significant event with a chemical poisoning of a water system that affected more than 220,000 people. What if that happened to you? They had schools that were closed down for an extended period of time because they couldn't get any water to the schools. They had drinking water. They could bring bottled water in. But 
you know, think about how much water you use in the course of your day in your school system. How about a law, an epidemic or a pandemic? How about, what would happen if 70% of your student body didn't show up for school for an extended period of time? How about your teachers? What if they were affected or your staff? Would you be able to continue operations? Do you have an alternate method of delivering education were that to occur? How about a public brand damage event? Very sadly, any of you on this call today could Google coach arrested, teacher arrested, school blank arrested. And sadly, we would see all too often a variety of instances that may occur with any of those people on our property at any given time. How would you deal with that? How about the number one concern of most people right now? Some sort of a hacking, a leak, or a data breach. Two kinds of organizations in the world, right? Those that have been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. How about a senior leadership failure? You know, one of the worst things that can happen to employee morale, student morale, parent morale, faith and trust in your organization is just that, a breach of trust. And then what about terrorism? You know, independent schools are many times of a secular nature. And many times because of that become a target for those persons with ill intent. What else? Some of you may be sitting listening today with other teammates in a room, in a conference room. You may be listening to a recording of this session via our YouTube uh, channel. You find that on our website. And what I want you to do is to take a moment to think about what the worst thing is that can happen to your organization today. Then I want you to ask a more important question of yourself and your team. Could you handle it? Take any of those events we just looked at. What would you do right now, today, if one of those happened? We're going to look at some outlier events, some things that we just didn't expect to happen. You know, we plan for things. We do uh, tornado drills. We do uh, lockdown, lockout. We do all those types of drills, don't we? We know, we think we know how we're going to uh, practice for those. But it's those outlier events that we just hadn't even thought of that become a significant challenge during a crisis because we hadn't really considered how we were going to handle it. So we need to do that when we have the leisure and the ability to do so. Now, I understand bandwidth is tight, so I appreciate your attending this session, especially during your break period. So when we ask, about a thousand organizations, what crisis event would be the number one concern for their organization? Um, actually, a cyber event or a cyber attack of some type was number one. And that was closely followed by some natural disaster event or uh, some violence in the, on the property. Those are the big ones that we, kind, we, we practice for those, don't we? We think those through. It is the nuance of events that can happen in these pieces of the pie that we must be ready for. And when these instances happen, when you think about this sort of weird outlier crisis that might happen, who would you contact? Who needs to know about it? Who are you going to communicate with? And who is affected? And then more important, how are you going to communicate? Let's look at a few examples. These are events nobody expected to have happen, and here they were. They happened. City of Dallas. This is the outdoor warning system. These are every siren in the city of Dallas, and uh, uh, there are 156 of them. And they cover a one-mile radius each. Over the weekend, someone hacked every single tornado siren for two hours. And if they can be hacked to go on, they can be hacked to go off, can't they? Well, I don't know if anybody has practiced for a two-hour duration hacking of the Dallas siren system. I don't know if that's happened in Tennessee. Now, there were some jokes that were made. 
Raphael did a survey over here on the left, and most people thought it was because of the zombie apocalypse. But when we think about it, it's not very funny, is it? If you were an eight-year-old child at home and suddenly heard those sirens go off for two hours, I think you'd be really frightened. What if you were at school when it happened? How would you respond? What would you do? Who would you contact? This hack um, is a really serious situation. And while we might joke about it, can we think about how that might happen, how that might unfold if it happened in our organizations, in our state? Um, last year, we saw a crane collapse across a major bridge that connects Westchester County to New York City. Well, how about we have a couple of busloads of kid on their, kids on their way into the city on a class trip to go see a play. Do we know what's happened? How have we found out? How will we help our students? What if we use this artery to travel every day? What if we have teachers who work in West, who live in Westchester and work in the city or vice versa? Are we going to have a problem now for the next month getting people to work or school? How about goods and services? Is this a major artery that brings us goods and services? If there's a problem with that, do we have to figure out some alternate means of getting food to our cafeteria or uh, people to our football game? I had a conversation the other day with uh, our CEO of Firestorm, it was about 6 o'clock in the morning, and he was on the road, and I asked him how long he'd been on the road, and he said, well, I had to leave about 3.30. He said, remember, we lost a major section of I-85 due to a fluke fire. He said, so now everybody is taking this alternative route, and so this alternative route is backing up into a massive traffic jam every day. So think about that in your area. Look around your school. Is there a major transportation artery right in front of you, or is that how people get to your school or your campus? What if that were gone? What if that were out? How would you plan for that? What would you do? This happened in Lynchburg, Virginia. There was a derailment of a crude oil tanker, a group of tanker cars. And the entire town had to be evacuated. What if that happened? How long would you be evacuated for? Did I just end that with a preposition? I'm sorry to all the teachers on the call. Um, but how long would the evacuation last? And what would you do if school were in session during that time? How do you evacuate? How do you keep your students safe? How did you find out about it? Did you hear the explosion? Or did you read it on a social media post? Did a parent call? Did all the parents call at once? What type of notification system are you using internally in your school to send out messaging? Does it also include social messaging? I love notification systems. I think they're great. We want anonymous reporting in school. We want notification systems so that I can tell, talk to all parents and other uh, important constituency at the same time. But we also need to not forget that there's social media out there that allows us to communicate appropriately with a wider audience so that we can make sure that the correct information is being delivered to the right people at the right time. So when we talk about building an intelligence network, it's not just about that social connection. It is about the personal connection we make and then taking that the next step into the social world. Kind of sounds like online dating, doesn't it? So the first thing you need to do is look around your school. What is the building or the property next to you? North, south, east, and west. What is housed in that property? Now, Sometimes organizations on our school association calls, uh, we also have camps sometimes that are uh, on our calls or church camps. Um, we also have uh, daycare facilities that might be 
in multi-tenant properties or buildings? Do you know who else is in the building with you? What are that building's uh, uh, next steps during a crisis or lockdown, lockout, et cetera? How close uh, physically are officials, police, fire, first responders? Have you had them on your property? Most likely you have. We do a really good job of bringing first responders onto our properties and educating our students and our staff. Um, but we want to make sure that we're also able to con connect with those. And the reason we want to is to connect in a social way on social media because there may be a threat that doesn't have anything to do with our property but is in close proximity. And the way we might find out might be via a Facebook post or a tweet. How would we know if we were not monitoring that event occurring? Can your connections help you message out in a crisis and certainly learn more before a crisis occurs so you can avoid it? And does messaging help keep people safer? And I think we know the answer is yes, it does. Next, I want you to look around at your property and say, maybe I'm not a risk, but maybe my neighbor's facility is. Is there a shrine or a temple that has been under attack or threat that I need to be aware of? Is a location a target where my students might be visiting? Are there transportation risks associated? Again, roads, rail, docks, ports. And what are our evacuation points? And more importantly, do we change our evacuation points to protect that knowledge? Why do we bring that up? Because we may have an event where evacuation is required, and we don't want someone, particularly a disgruntled former employee, it could be a student who wants to harm people in property, you know, organizations who knows our evacuation points and can then make that evacuation point the actual prime target when we thought it was possibly through the internal or front desk of the school. By creating a robust network of people, real people, face-to-face -face people, in combination with technology and digital monitoring, and this is monitoring of public information, never private. We just aggregate it, filter out the noise, and then using professional analysts, put the messaging into context. We're able, if an event occurs, to make sure you're in a position to receive or send communication more effectively. And more important, you may see something coming. Sadly, we saw an incident. We saw too many incidences this week, but sadly, we saw a, a former disgruntled employee return to the workplace and kill two people. And this person did have a pretty broad social media uh, profile. There was a public profile uh, that this person posted on Facebook. They also had a Twitter account, and this Twitter account actually posted to a second Facebook account, there may have been information posts or some indication that something was challenging occurring. There may have been other steps, and I don't certainly want to blame the victim, but we always want to look at these events so that we can analyze and say, what was the language, what was the behavior, can we keep someone else safe because of the knowledge we gain from this? because every crisis is a human crisis. And the aftermath of an event like this is significant and deserves attention so that we can predict, plan, and perform. And after an event like this, we need to understand, too, how to watch, who is watching. You know, the image that you see in the right-hand corner is actually from a tool. We use a couple of different state-of-the-art tools to do this public monitoring via uh, social conversations. And we actually had uh, quite a few organizations in Boston 
thank us, clients at the time, uh, thank us because we alerted them prior to officials alerting them that there was a situation evolving in Boston at the race. We saw um, that there was suddenly a flurry of social activity. It said, I'm okay, something really bad just happened by the finish line. We were able to contact our clients and let them know they either wanted to make plans to release employees early or students early. They wanted to look at alternative means of helping those people get to their homes. Roads were going to be shut down. We knew parts of the city were going to be shut down. We knew the next day and for many days after, people would not be allowed back into the city. There may be a manhunt. It was a frightening situation on many fronts. And predictive intelligence can help us let you know when something occurs. Now, trust me, the best news I give to our clients that we do monitoring for is there's nothing to tell you today. That's the best thing I can say. And we are not the people using this for marketing. You may have marketing teams that can also use the application if you want to use it for marketing opportunities and new enrollment opportunities for your school. That's not what Firestorm does. Firestorm is helping you look for risk so that you can predict the situation, plan what you're going to do about it, and then if something ever should occur, perform at your optimum. The earlier problem is detected, we know the less impact it's going to have on the organization. And initial threats are often observed on social media. I think we're going to see instances of that here in just a few slides. And most of these messages on social media really do provide very specific information if you understand how to read it, if you understand the language, the culture, the geographic region, and what the syntax of the messaging may be. And that's what we do with our analysts. Now, I do apologize for the images and image you're about to see, but I don't think anybody expected this event to occur this week. And basically, in essence, I'm sure you've read about the United Airlines situation where the information is still evolving because we know that information we learn in the first hour or two of an event is probably wrong. And we've been getting information on this now for about three days, and it's changing. We get different pieces and parts of the facts. But the one fact I can tell you we know is that at any given time today in this society, if something happens, there are going to be five or six people with cell phones pointed at your event taking a video of it. So we have video proof that we know something happened. Now, the context of that is kind of an elusive thing right now. Basically, we saw that United Airlines may have overbooked a flight. Not overbooked, but they wanted to deadhead some crew from Chicago uh, to Kentucky. And so when nobody took them up on their offer, they uh, then had a computer select some people, and this person was one of them. Uh, this person was on the phone with their attorney prior to being forcibly removed. Um, so as this evolved, they, were, they actually were on the phone with their attorney listening to uh, the police officers tell him that he had to exit the flight. He somehow got away from them and got back on the flight. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a couple of images that are still from a video that someone else videoed from a few different angles. Uh, that show him returning to the flight disoriented, et cetera. Well, I show this to you for a couple of reasons. First of all, I don't think anybody planned for this event. I don't know that anybody at United Airlines sat down and said, okay, if we grab somebody by his arms and he hits his head and he's bleeding and we drag him off the plane, no matter the reason, is everybody going to videotape it? The, the, is everybody videotaping it? Is, is it a yes? But did they actually talk about that other situation? Probably not. I think they should. I think you should. I think you should talk about a zombie apocalypse. I think you should talk about all of the unreal things that could happen in the event that something unreal does happen. You have had some conversation around the nuance of that crisis. And next, who is going to comment on the crisis? 
Oscar Munoz is the CEO of United Airlines. Just about a month ago, Mr. Munoz was selected by PR Week as its 2017 Communicator of the Year. I don't think he was thinking about that when this first response was communicated that was then shared by the United Airlines account. In its first or its second line, there's an insincere moment where Mr. Munoz says, I apologize for having to reaccommodate these customers. If by reaccommodate you mean drag off the plane by their arms bloodied, then I think we need to redefine what the word reaccommodate means. But there is an insincerity in that response. And do you know why? Because he didn't have time to think about it. He didn't take the time to understand the facts of the case, to talk to his key folks, and to say, we really need to be clear and accurate and protect the safety of our customers who come first, our staff and employees, and our brand and our reputation. When you're in a crisis, Jim Satterfield says something. We have a program called Crisis Stop, and we call it Crisis Stop because that's what we want to plead with you to do. We just want you to stop. Just stop. You have a lot of people that are informal coaches in the background telling you, got to get in front of this, got to get in front of this, we got to get a statement out to the press. Why? And Jim Satterfield says, after you've done a crisis stop, and all those people are telling you what to do, ask yourself why, at a minimum five times. Why are we communicating right now? How will this help us this moment? How will a half an hour hurt communication right now? There's a very big difference between I need to communicate right now because if people don't move from that spot they're in, they're going to get hurt, to, we're sorry we had to reaccommodate some passengers. I mean, there's just some real difference there. So you've got to put it into context. And to help you is if you have created a robust intelligence network, you will be getting the right kind of data coming in from your monitoring efforts as well as the right kind of communication coming in from those people who are actually on the phone with you, face-to-face -face with you. So you can make critical decisions based on real information, not on reflex information. Why? Because we want to avoid something like this. This is Robert Butler Jr.'s final message that he posted on social media before he returned to Millard South High School and shot and killed the assistant principal and wounded the principal during the attack. Read this. Think about this. If you could know this and stop it from happening, if you could go back in time to when Robert Butler was writing this and take the pen out of his hand or his hands off the keyboard and get him help, wouldn't you? I know you would. That's what we're doing. We had a great tragedy this week in San Bernardino that has had enough trouble visiting them. In this situation, we didn't have a random school shooter show up at the school. We had the domestic violence visit the school. It is a domestic violence incident in the workplace. And very sadly, a child who was standing be behind the intended victim was wounded and ultimately died of his wounds. The woman killed was an instructor in the special needs class, and the shooter was her husband. And this is a post that he posted in July of 2016 on his Facebook wall. It's about something else. It's a little out of context. 
But in it, he says it's the folks who think they have nothing to lose with their evil ways that puts innocent people at risk to die. Most set up people kill the innocent. If we could go back in time and fix this, wouldn't we? Well, we can't fix every situation, but we can help you identify behaviors of concern so that children like Jonathan Martinez have a greater chance of living a full and rich life. Because I know for everyone on this call with the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools, your number one goal is to make sure that your students, your staff, and your community are not only safe but enriched by your miss mission and education of your students. So how do we find these threats? Through this predictive intelligence and creating an intelligence network. So we take that combination of people connections that we have and, it's, and we combine it with these social digital connections that we have. We become aware of our surroundings, both digitally and in real life. Not that digitally isn't real life, but I think you know what I mean. We put communications into context, and we then implement tools and training to complement the effort. In that situation in San Bernardino, I want you to ask your teachers today, I want you to ask your front office or your reception or your resource officer, whatever that situation as you walk into the doors of your school are. And if you know Jane and Robert Doe as a couple, and you know that Jane is a teacher in your school, and let's say Robert is a, uh, an attorney in town, and, and Robert is a really active member of a uh, parent-teacher, and he comes to every football game, and they've had their own kids in the school system for years, so everybody knows this couple in the community. And let's say Robert comes up to the front desk and says, hey, I don't know if you know this, but it's Jane's and my anniversary. I have a surprise for her today. And give your front reception a wink and says, I'm just going to go back and surprise her, OK? I bet most of your schools would let that person through. So we need to have a talk about this. Your next in service, let's talk about that situation, how that evolved. Was there a way that we could help Jane Doe prior to the situation? Did we see behaviors of concern on her part that might lead us to believe there was a domestic situation that we needed to protect her from? Or was she afraid to talk about it for fear she might lose her job? And then, through a social or technological way, once we know that Jane has some concerns, can we monitor the public communications, both digitally and otherwise, of the person who may be threatening harm so that we can keep a violent act from occurring? Every day, we see hundreds of threats. We review them. We put them into context on behalf of our clients. And we have a team of analysts who really understand how to help filter out the noise for your specific location and for the syntax, for the way people talk in your geographic region. The way people refer to certain drugs or weapons is different in, let's say, New York than it is in, let's say, Texas or New Mexico or Tennessee. We need to be using the language of your population. And we need to understand social activity as a whole as best we can. So for instance, this statement, I'm taking my gun to school, yesterday they tried to jump me, is actually a very popular lyric from a song. I'm going to take my gun to school. Yesterday they tried to jump me. It's, 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 you'll see it wandering all across the web. Does that mean we ignore it? No. 
But when we let you know that someone in your school has said this, we're going to give you the context that they may be repeating some lyrics they heard in a rap song. And we just want to have a talk with the person that maybe this isn't the best use of their time on social media. It's up to them. It's up to their parents, certainly. But at least we're aware, right? And we can give you tools. And we can give you training. You can do it yourself. You can have us help you do it as you build out your network, both face-to-face, uh, -face, both live and digitally. And we can help you show the ROI of what you're monitoring and why. Because while technology is used to connect, we know that it's the people that truly make your intelligence network. What's more important is that threatening behavior is clear. If I say to you, you need to do this or I'm going to punch you in the nose, that's pretty much a threat. That's pretty clear. But behavioral risks, behavioral concerns are not quite as clear. And there are other ways that we might be able to identify some significant behavioral changes that may indicate a call for help. Those might be certainly something broad, cutting behaviors that might be posted on an Instagram account. It might be troubles with food or bulimia, anorexia that are growing, and we see again posted on a social account. We might see poor, cha uh, poor hygiene or changes in appearance. So these are subtler signals and cues that help us to understand if there is a problem. And the reason we look at these things, folks, is because in almost every situation of school violence that we have seen, there has been a manifesto of some type posted. There has been a manifesto on a Tumblr account or a blog, on 4chan or 6chan. If you don't know what those are, contact me. I'll let you know. A video manifesto, a series of multiple four, five-hour videos going on and on about what next steps were going to be in the escalation of Elliot Roger, a Facebook manifesto. And we study these because if we know the language, if we know the terms that are being used, we can better help you keep your school, your students, and your employees in community safer. We know that today organizations have an expectation of the management of risk. And we know that your management and leadership just doesn't have the bandwidth to know what's happening all the time. That's what we're here for. We can help supplement that. Unfortunately, threats, bullying, and other activities that start on social media very often then escalate into the real world. So we hope that you can in some way utilize our expertise to help you implement a program, whether we're involved or not, that helps keep your environment safer. Because while we can't guarantee any specific result, and we can't catch 100% of the conversation that may reference you or your organization, we know that if we can just catch one reference that may keep someone safe, that you would want to know. I know I'd want to. When we asked, uh, do you currently use external intelligence to identify potential threats, only 30% of the organizations we surveyed said yes. We can group these other groups together and see that almost 70% either don't have anything in place, don't know what they have in place, don't know how it's used. And that puts those organizations into what we call a stage one of a level of maturity as an organization. And that's where they are in a culture of surprise, where everything is a liability. What we really want to do is move you into the stage four culture of strategic communication awareness, where you can predict, plan, and perform in a highly efficient and timely manner, because you have the right information available to make the right decisions. Remember, the greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge.
So, what next? You can download the brief from our website. Uh, it should be ready in about 48 hours. You can go to firestorm.com forward slash brief and download the predictive intelligence or any of our other papers or uh, learning resources. And you can also contact the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools. And we have a special channel set up for you on our YouTube uh, channel. Our YouTube channel is Continuity Experts. You can find that on our website. And then just look for the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools channel, and all of your sessions are there. And we sincerely appreciate the support of such a great association. You can reach out to us at any time. I'm Karen Masulo. It's kmasulo at firestorm.com. I'll be happy to answer any question you have. You can reach out to the lovely and attractive Bill Baker, who's our moderator today at webinars at firestorm.com, or give us a call at our 1-800 number or contact us through our website. Thanks so much for taking time from what for many of you is break period in the spring. I look forward to speaking to you next month. Next month we're going to have a special guest talking to to us about natural disasters and preparation. So register now and register early, and we look forward to speaking to you then. This will end today's session. Once again, thank you, and have a great day.